It is This Week in Pharmacy. I am the founder of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, the podfather of pharmacy, Todd Yuri, here in the studios, Brownsville, Pennsylvania, live on Phar Pharmacy Friday. I'm so excited today because, as you know, I'm 10 times more uh, excited when we have people in the studio. I have people in the studio that are here with us from WVU School of Pharmacy, the pain guy, Mark Garofoli, <laughs> the one and only pain guy, and um, and his, and his uh, dean of pharmacy, Dr. Bill Petros, PharmD, dean of the pharmacy school of WVU. That is you. I'm excited <laughs> that you're both here. Um, I'm telling you, we have so much to talk about. Uh, we have some news to go over. Uh, we're going to talk about mobile education and pharmacy and why I think podcasting as uh, as a media that is just sprouting up and we have 155 million listeners now throughout the country that there's something to that with regards to pharmacy education but before i get started i want to shoot on over to mark and just ask you this is my first time <laughs> that i've had you in the studio as the pain guy to actually chill out and just be here and talk so i'm so glad that you're here happy to be here too it, it's one heck of a studio in town for that matter as well so <laughs> pain pod nation hope you're out there listening to twerks pain pod twerks <laughs> um bill it's great to have you here it's so much fun to have you back you came to our first mobile symposium last mm -hmm. year i think it was in november but just having you back is just a, is a thrill for me fantastic to be back and see where it all happens in in real time yeah, it's it's funny that when you see it for real, it's different than when you just watch it. Because I've watched programs now that I've done some of this live stuff, and I can kind of pick up on what they're doing, how they're doing it, and kind of the magic behind the scene. But that actually might be a good episode of Twerks is a behind the scenes uh, episode to show everybody the insides of of what we do at this week in pharmacy. All right, so I'm going to kick off some discussion between the three of us with regards to um, what's happening in our world this week in pharmacy. And this week in pharmacy, an article came out on the 17th of August that said CVS stock plunges after Blue Shield of California drops the retailer's pharmacy services to save on drug costs. In some ways, gentlemen, this is not really shocking news to us because we've been saturating and soaking in a pharmacy for, you know, all of us more than 20 years each. Um, and I'll tell you, the, the PBM payment model and the way that pharmacy is paid for today is under a tremendous amount of scrutiny and pressure finally. And I'm getting excited because I feel like we're kind of moving into a new age of of what a pharmacist is literally going to do and be paid to do in the future. It's going to be much different than it is right now, but I'm going to start out with bill. What, what do you, what do you think of this news and, and what does this make you feel as somebody that's been in the industry for so long? Well, you know, I, I think this is maybe a reflection of a lot of the literally pain that patients and pharmacists have un, undergone for probably over a decade now. Um, and we're finally starting to hear some of this in real fashion. It's maybe going to change practices, um, both legislatively and, you know, uh, commercially within insurers, et cetera. So. What about you, Mark? What, what does this, I mean, this is a big deal. So it, it's, it's another crack in the armor of our status quo, you know, payment ways of, of functioning today. But what is your thoughts on this? So I like to keep things succinct. I think of some letters. Um, you know, us, us pharmacy professionals, we're used to FDA, we're used to DEA. We're not really down with the FTC all that much, though, mm -hmm. and they're getting involved now. So yeah. getting real, it's been real. Uh, it's, it's certainly headlines, that's for sure. It is. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what's happening specifically, obviously, in PBM reform, but there's multiple things that have accelerated, and I really think that we're going to see some big changes in 2024, at least legislative um, proposals that will get much uh, more acceptance than what has been happening over the last uh, 10 years. All right, next up, let's talk about the Ohio Board of Pharmacy proposes sweeping new regs to deal with understaffing. Um, this is interesting. It was brought to our attention by uh, Bill. So you're up first. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> What do you think of this? Well, uh, we've all heard the stories of pharmacies having to close because of staffing issues um, and maybe because other pharmacies were kind of put out of business. 
And I think that uh, it's recently got a lot of public attention. Um, and I think now boards are starting to take actions based on that. I know to some degree it's happened in West Virginia, and it sounds like it's going to happen to even a larger degree in Ohio soon. Mark. So boards of pharmacy everywhere are in a tough place when you think about it. Um, they, are, they are in place to protect the public. And regardless of our profession, we're the public. So that's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, in recent years, uh, probably for a while, really, uh, it, it's really been the profession of pharmacy speaking up on behalf of the public. I, you know, everybody that's keeping the boat afloat is now congelling together and, and making some things happen. This is one you know, major headline recently, but there's been more uh, certainly covered even uh, within this program uh, where we're, we're seeing trends now. The, the ball, the inertia is not an issue anymore. The ball is rolling. It's just, it's got a long path, right? I want to use this as an example for our listeners. Pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, um, you are the ones in the trenches. You are the ones who understand how policy, how laws, how even payment is going to impact patient care. Please don't be afraid to get involved. You have a voice because you're credible. <laughs> You're, you're about as credible as you can get of being in the trenches and, and, and being there for you. And you are an advocate for your patient. So remember that. And if there's ever any way to get, reach out to your boards of pharmacy, get educated, and then get involved by pitching in uh, with your knowledge of what's going on, document your knowledge, send an email out maybe once a quarter or even twice a year or something, just for your views with your state policymakers, your Congress, your state representatives, your board of pharmacies, but that's the way to stay engaged. And that's how we actually change things is I think by the, by more pharmacists getting involved in, in what is patient care. All right. Before we get into today's um, topic, which is mobile education and support in pharmacy. The last thing uh, which was uh, kicked off and suggested by Mark was RSV antibody drug for babies and toddlers gives Parents, new options to protect their children. Mark, we're going to start off with you. Of course you start since I mentioned it. <laughs> um, I mentioned fault. it because I know of its relevance and I defer and to And Gretchen's all. not here uh, to yeah, save me. <laughs> Shout but, out to but, Dr. Gretchen Garofoli. <laughs> Um, you gotta be, you gotta come to Torx. You gotta get her. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's enough immunization things going on in the world that should her and a couple hundred thousand other pharmacists need That's to be right. here. Um, but yeah, you know, as a pharmacist, as a parent, uh, th th this is a headline or a topic uh, that certainly resonates, I think, with all of us automatically. Uh, you know, we, we were in pharmacy. We did a lot with influenza, with flu shots, um, you know, changing the model for our whole country. COVID hit. You know how we rock that, right? Um, well, now RSV is a new realm. Uh, and and I quite frankly, as, as Todd Caster said here, I defer all of that to my wife. <laughs> it's, I'm paying guy. Anything else? I don't. I don't want to ever tell a patient or even a family member something incorrect. So I defer to her at all times. Um. I think that's a good example of how many um, channels and how many themes of pharmacy are going to be sprouting up, and how many more roles of pharmacists that are going to be coming out based on digital therapeutics based on disease state treatments that are very specific to say cancers or breast cancers or the specialties. You just gave me an example of a role of a pharmacist that understands not only vaccines and the worries that a, pa a parent might have, but a pediatric vaccine, which I think is even to me, that's 10 times more sensitive. I have four daughters. I, I would want to know, you know, more about it and I would be more sensitive about it, but that's a really good point, Mark. All right. Um, I want to turn things over to our subject today, which is, you know, my passion to bring attention to the pharmacy profession and the stars um, of, of our, the most innovative pharmacists out there in different themes and why it's special that Mark uh, is here as one of our network members. Mark, when I first, I don't remember if I reached out to you, reached out to me, it was through LinkedIn. I do remember that. I remember we were connected already, but I had no one that was really focused on pain management. And it might have been an inquiry through a message. I should actually sneak back into my <laughs> messages and find out. But talk to me about going from being a writer 
and someone that is uh, in front of pharmacy students and trans transitioning to the creation of content through podcasting and how that's what that's done for you in your career as well as um, your own personal um, knowledge of of that great that extra research that you do as a podcaster. It's a it's an adventure. Uh, and and I could almost guarantee you that we connected on LinkedIn because that's the root of everything anymore, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I've been accused of being on there too much by very few people, uh, but I, I guarantee you that's where we originally connected. Um, I remember those times, the beginning of the venture very well. Uh, I remember I, I had said, it's not a no, it's just to give a little bit of time because we tend to plan out our, our years. And here we are. <laughs> um, but yeah, podcasting, Compared to uh, you mentioned writing or uh, pr doing presentations, whether it's in a classroom or it's you know for pharmacists and pharmacy technicians out in, in the field at fancy hotels, conferences, whatever. Um, it, it there's distinct similarities, and then certainly things that are different. Um, I I usually to to wrap it all together with think of one of my favorite quotes actually Mark Twain. Same name, right? Um, sorry, his quote. Uh, sorry, I would have made this letter shorter, but I didn't have the time. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I learned distinctly when I was doing a, a TED talk about impromptu is actually another language for excessively planned out. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of the planning that everyone does with a, a podcast or similarly with a presentation or writing or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of planning in the background. The hamster is always going. Yep. <laughs> um, you got to let him rest every now and then, of course. But uh, there's just a lot of planning in the background. Um, that being said, us pharmacists, that's what we do. Yes. <laughs> I mean, True. The, so it, it's, uh, you know, pharmacy and podcast both start with P. They have more than that in common, um, obviously, with this network. But for for aspiring pharmacists, technicians out there who are even thinking about, hey, should I ever do this? Do it. Yeah. Ask questions later. Um, you know, it, there is the planning in the background. Uh, but at the same time, you you can be catapulted and get connected with folks that you would have had to make 65 phone calls, 373 emails to even get a hello back. Yep. Uh, but all of a sudden it's, oh, there's a podcast. I'll talk to this guy. Yep. And eventually he'll call himself pain guy. Yeah. <laughs> that guy. guy. Which is a trademark, um, right? Yes. Yes, sir. That's um, so cool. At website now, pain guy. Pain guy. Check it out. Folks. <laughs> um, but anyways, it, it's, it's an adventure as I call anything that uh, is enjoyable along the way, of course. Uh, but it is yet another facet uh, for us in pharmacy to, to either have a voice and, or create a voice for others uh, that the podcast that, that, I run and, and host, uh, like many other hosts on the Pharmacy Podcast Network, we're, we're there to give voices to everyone else. It's not just us with the microphone. It, yep. It's getting people's voices and thoughts out there because uh, you never know what's the seed for something bigger down the road. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So there's an element to lost communications, in my opinion, as someone who's getting older. Um, I can now say that, uh, Bill. But <laughs> you've seen the difference between communication skills in the generation Xers, uh, that's Mark and I, and you know your generation and the younger generations and generation, I think they call it, um, what's the Z? next? Z? Millennials and <laughs> Zs, right? Mm -hmm. So communications and pick up the phone and call, that's just not something that the young folk really like to do these <laughs> days, right? So when I think of podcasting and really breaking them out of their shell and allowing them to think um, by listening and think by preparing and then bringing together, you know, other of their cohorts and speaking to each other with respect and with professionalism and preparing, but keeping it fun, you know, obviously, because it has to be fun. What are your thoughts around the element of injecting podcasting into supporting curriculum and, and, and learning? Yeah, I, I think it, it is uh, an added element. If you say, you know, we, we kind of think of different ways to engage our students now and active learning and traditional classroom teaching and hands-on work um, and group work. Um, and this is just another element, I think. And, and kind of as society in general, we've, we've learned a lot about using podcasts to um, multitask and, and mm -hmm. learn some things. And I think that we're only beginning to explore how we could use it in education. Um, 
both for group learning, sharing information, as well as um, just getting people's voices out and their opinions on things in a different way than what we've traditionally done. Yep. I'm thinking of it as a sandbox for three, six uh, students who are um, who are either extroverted who like that spotlight or <laughs> even introverted that just want a chance to exercise their communication skills with people who they know and kind of trust and have laughed with. And the fact that we're on video today is not the traditional podcast. It's it's mm -hmm. podcasting has become so popular that a lot of our consumers want the extra visual, right? But the traditional podcast, the real podcast is a audio only. Mm -hmm. So I think about the shy scientific nerds that are most pharmacists out there that may not want to be on, might not want to be on film, but they would be very comfortable with a microphone talking to each other about the last epidemiology um, presentation that was very intense, uh, has a ton of data to be learned, and how do you soften and make it enjoyable and refresh with each other, just like the days of book review and, and, and class cohort review where they get together. And it doesn't even have to be necessarily correct. It can just be opinionated, it can be open, but having someone kind of lead the conversation with outline and of course taking people down and in, into the subject matter and then to listen to that as I'm jogging as a student or I'm or I'm driving home, you know, for a break and I get to listen to a bunch of my you know cohorts and and mm -hmm. students talk about a complex subject. Mark, I just think that that's like another level of learning that they can embrace each other and help each other. Um, especially if, if I hear someone say something from their perspective, sometimes it makes me learn it a little differently because they have brought up a point that I've forgotten about. It's, it's almost like we always talk about in, in all education, not just pharmacy, but the, the teach back method. And we deploy that with uh, patients all the time too of blah, 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 info. All right, what did you hear? What do you understand? <laughs> it's almost like students can then do that for each other, um, not to compete with a tutoring program, but to complement a tutoring program. Yeah. Um, if you can podcast it, then you've learned it um, along the way. So. Exactly. And I think that it gives us, it gives us an opportunity to teach the um, students and teach the young future pharmacists to start relying on each other for specificity and project management and together, because if you had that same group of um, students for the next semester, all coming together, let's say once a week or once every two weeks to bring together what was learned those previous two weeks, it's a checking of, it's a balance and it's saying maybe the following week, Hey, you missed this when we talked about you know, cancer, I don't know what you guys call your classes, cancer 101, um, <laughs> uh, worst maker upper of, of, of oh, classes. We, we deploy numbers, <laughs> letters, <Of> you know. <laughs> yeah. and I think the other component to that too, to think about is that um, kind of um, students teaching other students, or once you've kind of learned it yourself, teaching it actually solidifies it in your mind True. or your interpretation of it. And uh, of course, and virtually all our lectures are taped. Our students watch them in arrears here and, you know, fast speed um, or listen to them in fast speed. Um, but it's not just a distillation of the slides or the content. I think it's interpretation of it. And hearing other students' interpretation of it really accentuates the learning. And it helps them in when they put it into words or uh, uh, to learn it themselves, I think, a lot easier. That's a good point. I want to bring something up and just give cheers to uh, Dr. Joni Carroll from Pitt. Um, she's received some new recognition for the series that she helped to kick off um, with uh, Pitt and Duquesne universities with a grant that was pushed through uh, the Pennsylvania Pharmacist Association. And I want to give a shout out to the PPA here, my, my association here in Pennsylvania, how great of a job that they work with the students and work with schools a shout out to um to them but this was a seven part series on talking about stigma and uh the disorders um uh, and and what what treatment how treatment is there's a barrier to treatment based on stigma and um what's interesting is uh, this content and this work that was done was pulled through the schools with many of the students participating in building this 
So I think that they should be very proud of themselves. Um, there's been over um, 15,000 listens to this series alone, which is just huge that we got to be, take part in distributing it. But this is an example that you could literally take disease states, conditions, um, concepts, knowing that pharmacists are going to face this in a multitude of settings, regardless of what you know sector they're going to go into, to really say, hey, here's a way to follow up learning on something and refresh your mind on a subject a year or two later through a podcast that has been certified for continuing education, for example. And now, of course, we all know that subjects will change and we want to add some things. But this think of how many times this specific series has been used by students to understand the concept of how stigma in, you know, impacts treatment and what that means for us. So fill in the blank, Mark. I mean, we could talk about a whole pain mm -hmm. management dive in. We could talk about addiction pain management. We could talk about back surgery pain and be, get very specific to the subject mm -hmm. and turn it into not only um, the round table I was thinking of, which is much looser in the sandbox environment, but in this case, literally turn it into continuing education. Yeah, and it's tagging CE credit into that. Um, you know, not everybody would probably claim it because you're just going to listen and enjoy and hopefully learn. But at the same time, it's available. Why not? I mean, do something different. Uh, there's other professions out there now that you can read a book, like in a book you buy at Barnes and Noble or Amazon, and then take a test and get CE credit for it. And I, I was left thinking when I learned that, why don't we do that? <laughs> <laughs> that would not be that hard. Um, so at, at, you know, polar opposite of podcasting, but same idea there of, you know, you're on, you're on the go, you're running. Why can't you do CE? We're multitasking every other minute of our lives. Yeah. So. Well, the, the, the Dean of uh, School of Pharmacy at WVU is in our studio right now. If you wanted to write a little, um, like write it on a piece of paper, like one of those idea shares and I'll put it in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to ask him if he had a needs assessment before he read the book. <laughs> <laughs> policy kicks in. That's how the administration works. Not our policy. <laughs> no, no. policies. CE <laughs> is like that too. What's the need for this? It's, um, it's on addiction. True. Yeah. <laughs> that should be like a, a, a shoe in in some ways, I guess. Yes. And like I say, it's not the school level. It's a national level. You have to deal with it. Oh, yeah. So what about um, the future of a pharmacy school being more specific to what um, we're, I, I always hear people say this, this is gonna, this is a multi-part question I'll, and I'll definitely start with you, Bill, but I'll hear people say, why aren't students learning more of X, right? I'll say, uh, you know, pharmacogenomics, we only get like one, you know, one chapter in it or something. And I always, def I have both sides. I have a defense to it. And then I have like, well, yeah, I guess that's a good point. The defense is, for goodness sakes, these poor young people, their minds are being stuffed with some of the most <laughs> complex math and science mm -hmm. and chemistry and everything that you could imagine and the stress that they're under. So why are you putting more you know, information and stress on them? Let those become specialties. And then on the other end of the you know, spectrum, I'm like, well, they, they should at least know it you know, a little bit more of something that seems to be innovative and in coming into the future of what's pharmacy. And, and what I mean is, is the changing in the sway of what you taught 30 years ago versus what you're teaching today and keeping up with where we're going in the future of pharmacy. But what are your thoughts around the comments that the quarter, the, the couch quarterbacks will make um, on curriculum like that? Yeah. So, you know, I think that uh, there's a hot term in pharmacy academia circles right now. It's called curricular hoarding. People want to teach what they've always taught. And so once we start adding new content, something's got to give, right? There's only so many hours in a day. There's so many hours in a class. So we have to be very careful about our core curriculum. And, you know, but we can always offer electives for things that students want to track in different ways, as long as we get enough students interested. Um, but I think, in my mind, we think about that lens of the half-life of our pharmacy education is not that long, mm -hmm. right? Things change and we have to set people up to be lifelong learners and we have to set them up with basic tenants they're gonna be able to build on. Pharmacogenomics is a good example. Another one is, let's, I'll, I'll take a, a more insular example to my own 
uh, edu- or, uh, prov- provision of education. One of the first lectures I ever did was I was a fellow at St. Jude and I lectured over at the University of Tennessee in biotechnology. Mm-hmm. That was in 19, I'll date myself, 1989, <laughs> 1988, okay? There was one drug on the market at the time, interferon. There were a lot of drugs out there that were thought of maybe as biotechnologic drugs. And I continued, they kept asking me to give these lectures, but they weren't relevant at the time. We didn't have a lot of drugs on, at the time. And really it took 20 or more years before now, most of the new drugs we're seeing are actually biotechnology related drugs. Um, And so there's a little bit of chicken before the egg kind of thing or think about that. Pharmacogenomics is somewhat in that arena. We got to make sure we we teach it. Um, The way that we try to embed it is we give them the basics of it. But then when we're talking about oncology or cardiovascular or pulmonology, we have the people that are talking about that that saying how we are incorporating it into those disease areas because they know kind of what's being done right now or what should be done. So there is some national, you know, consortiums that that do rank the clinical relevance of genomics. And we try to base our data on them because you just can't teach everything that's not going to be clinically relevant right now when they get out, but they need to understand the tenets of it so they can then apply it once that becomes clinically relevant. So that's my two cents on <laughs> on that it, piece of it. It reminds me of the concept of test betting um content that would become curriculum. And once again, Mark, it turns my um, thoughts to content development as an extra additive to curriculum where you're saying to a uh, pharmacy cohort, hey, pharmacy students, uh, here's a bucket of content, um, podcast videos made up by previous students as well as participation from our our, our um, faculty. Um, but you're not going to get tested on it. It's really innovative concepts that we know are out there that we think you should know about, but it's not true curriculum yet, but we're setting the, we're setting the stage because guess what we have the ability to do. We have the ability to send out surveys and say, what was the, was the library of content this past semester? Was it something that was interesting? Was it done well? And oh, by the way, is it something that you think could become a future, um, you know, subset of, of what is pharmacy. What do you think of that? Yeah, that could, that could spur, um, you know, as Bill put there, there's electives for the specialty things, not specialty pharmacy necessarily, Mm but you know, uh, for, for these offsets that are huge avenues could uh, become careers for people long enduring careers. Um, yet at the time, there's a gazillion drugs. You got to learn everything. You got to be able to be a jack of all trades as far as a pharmacist. Um, I I haven't made an IV in a long time, but I had to be trained to do one so that I could walk around saying, Hey, I'm a pharmacist. (laughs) Um, It's been a while, right? (laughs) Um, But it's these things that you're, you're talking about proposing. It it really gives the, the driver's seat to our student pharmacists across the whole nation. Um, I, you know, I, you know, we're all pharmacists, right? Also a dad. I remember a couple of days ago, I was watching our, our uh, seven-year-old, um, newly minted seven-year-old uh, Luke. He wanted something in the kitchen. It was in the fridge. And he went over, he grabbed a chair, he figured out how, and he went and he got it. And afterwards, after he was done with his snack, I said, dude, like, I couldn't be prouder. <laughs> you wanted something, you went and you got it. So to it all out. of our pharmacy students out there, go get it. <laughs> Uh, go make a podcast with the podcaster. Go get it <laughs> on. Um, it might be more than a snack, of course, in a fridge, but uh, sure. same idea. It's the same. It is the same idea. I think that it when when Bill, when you said earlier in the interview, you said people that teach they learn that subject much more or better than if you didn't teach it. And I, I reference back to going to a swim camp when I was a um, junior in high school, but I was also a swim coach. And when I went and got taught specific things about from the Red Cross about swim lessons and the way to, it was, it was once, uh, and I thought I knew it pretty good. It wasn't until I taught it and saw what was (laughs) real and how the, how the kids were reacting to it, that I would adjust how I was teaching it, which wasn't book, you know, uh, page to page verbatim of what the Red Cross said. But sure enough, it was mixed in. But I didn't get, 
I didn't get to be a better swim coach and swim instructor until I literally started teaching or that made, even though I knew, I knew it from the, I got a, I got a, an, a, I don't know, they didn't call it an A, but I got like one of the highest scores <laughs> in the Red Cross, you know, but I didn't, I wasn't a good instructor until I literally started instructing. Yeah. It kind of dives back into our uh, clinical tenet of do one, teach one, or learn one, do one, teach one. Right. So we knew that, we know that happens with hands-on things. It happens with non-hands-on things too, things that we're learning. And it, it actually, back when PharmD programs were only like 20 kids or so, um, some of the programs actually took that approach where students would have to go out and learn content and then come teach their classmates. Now there would be an instructor in the room to kind of help guide them, et cetera. But by doing that, they you know really uh, learned a lot, I think. So we're gonna take a short break, but when we come back, I wanna talk more about the opportunities that podcasting can present not only our students, but then pharmacists in practice as well that, that can leverage. I'm um, gonna take a quick break to, to, to show our sponsor today, which I have in the office, in the uh, studio. NasoCleanse actually used this and uh, we will be right back. <laughs> All right. I don't know if you've heard of this product, Mark uh, or Bill. I've talked to you about it, but NasoCleanse is this little applicator thing um, that you put uh, some substance on. I'm not a pharmacist, so I'm not exactly sure what this substance even is. I could actually sit here and read it to you, but <laughs> Naso <laughs> NasoCleanse, uh, the active ingredient is, oh, look, Mark, it's a, it's a pharmacy word. What does that say? <laughs> Benzalconium. Chloride, 0.13%, obviously. There we go. Can't say we've heard that in a while. <laughs> See, you have an applicator, you stick it in your nose, you wiggle it around. And I tried this when I was at the NACDS uh, in Las, I mean, Las Vegas, San Diego. <laughs> I don't know where I was. That I was one time you weren't in Las Vegas. That's right. <laughs> it's always not, I can't stand Las Vegas. But this, uh, the applicator uh, was easier than I thought it was. Um, it, it did, in fact, about an hour after I did it, it made my uh, nasal passages definitely feel like they opened up a little bit. And uh, Dr. Gale, um, who is their founder, um, physician, uh, was describing to me how disgusting and dirty our nasal passages are and what we're exposed to. And of course, it it opened me up to saying, that's it, I'm, I'm going to buy a, buy a pack and, and bring it in. And so that's why it's here in the studio. So you guys are gonna have to have to try it. I might send you home with some nasal cleanse, actually. Maybe one of the noses too. <laughs> yeah, I only have one nose. We have we have a nose you here. <laughs> I'll give everybody it, I, if you're if you're listening uh, and you don't. Here's the close up of the nose. So if you're just driving and you're just listening to the podcast, I am holding up a plastic spongy nose that is actually like used for stress management, I guess. And if you want to <laughs> squeeze the nose, go right ahead. But um, yeah, I think I think it's a it's an interesting product. I think that it's going to do well in community pharmacy that has an opportunity to talk about back to school and, um, and, um, you know, college, your, your, all, every time I get sick markets, my uh, infested little, um, 11 year old or my 14 year old that always bring the crap back. I was going right there in my head too. I, th I thought this was actually something that I can give my kid and say, do this instead of picking your nose, <laughs> <laughs> pick up the nose. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. We're going to get back on track. All right. So I'm thinking from a pharmacy school perspective, um, one of the parts of learning is understanding as a pharmacy student, how often you're going to have to work with nurses, how often you're going to have to work with physicians, the type of inter, um, Interhelping, I don't know what the word is. Interdisciplinary. See, I can't say it. <laughs> That's the word. Interdisciplinary. <laughs> yes. About working together, right? Mm -hmm. WVU is one of those environments that literally give the pharmacy students and the medical students, and then whatever. I think you have dental, dental students, dental, nursing, physical therapy, See, PA. It's like I mean, it, it's like only an perfect. Give the list. It's <laughs> the perfect. Yeah, here it's a commercial. And now brought to you by WVU School of Pharmacy, Bill Petros, Doctor Petros. We have to create a little commercial for you. <laughs> but no, I'm thinking. So once again, you have this environment where you have access to all these students. 
that would blow my mind if we had a mashup podcast opportunity to take a disease state or a condition and you throw these you know provider students together mm -hmm. and you say now let's take it from our quarterback let's start with our physician physician kick us off all right now where are you sending it to oh i'm sending it to the pharmacist then it goes to the physical therapist then we're gonna i mean that is a pod like i want to do that podcast so just I get first dibs at recording <laughs> whenever we try that one out. Well, you know, the, the other term for that is interprofessional education. And actually the person that is <laughs> leads interprofessional education at our health science center is uh, a woman by the name of Dr. Gina Ba. And she's actually on faculty in the school of pharmacy, but does interprofessional education for the whole health science center. And she would be a great person to have on your podcast. Absolutely. She actually lives in Pennsylvania. So, yeah. um, and uh, she starts stalking her. Yeah. <laughs> but, but she's put together some very innovative things, starting with trying to figure out ways in which groups of those kinds of students can then empathize with the patient, can empathize with, well, first with people that maybe aren't of the same affluence as they grew up in, then as they can empathize with patients, and then as they work together. When you really talk to employers, oftentimes what they'll say is, yes, we need someone that's going to be able to pass the boards and, and you know, be astute at their profession. But one of the most important traits is they, they're a team player. And as we all know, you know, the practice of, of medicine and healthcare is a team game today. Yep. And you're going to be probably equally likely to talk to someone that's not of your discipline on a daily basis more so than you might talk to a fellow pharmacist. Yep. Uh, my wife works in a hospital. She works in an ICU setting. And it's just incredible the number of people that are working with her. And she's a pharmacist, working with dietitians and pulmonologists and, you know, respiratory therapists and pathologists and so on and so forth. And so that ability to be a team player starts early on in their education. And that's why we love it. We're in one big building with all those people because they become friends and they can work together both in simulations and then on clinicals. And so. Yeah, it's, it's really a beautiful environment. And when I came down um, to meet up with um, Mark's P3s last year, which is, I think it's coming up in October again, right? Tick tock, tick tock. I cannot wait. <laughs> but anyway, when I got that opportunity and I I stopped and, and when I think the classes were, um, were changing. Mm -hmm. And I got to see it happen that there were so many and one would come out of the department area to the another. And then some of them were friends already. And, and I was like, wow, this, this is the, this is where I'd want if my child is going, I hope I have four daughters. So I hope one of them someday <laughs> will be a pharmacist. Um, but we'll start, I'll give them applications for WVU <laughs> today, 14 and 11, but who knows what's going to happen with those two. <laughs> but to think of them being able to have an opportunity to talk with and collaborate um, students at their, at their level is going to create, uh, more respect and more ability to work together and thinking outside the box, working together in the future when they literally do it yeah. and lifelong friendships. True. So that's exactly. Cool so. so that is something that I want to follow up with, with the school. I would also want to give a shout out to other schools or other deans of pharmacy that are listening. Um, Dr. Stephen Cutler, uh, we're going to be reaching out to you from mm -hmm. South Carolina University School of Pharmacy to see if you want to um, work on the same thing. But I think it's very special that WVU with the new medical center, the new pediatric unit that you've put in, um, some of the things that are taking place, it makes it so much easier to build those collaborations versus universities who don't have um, those multiple settings and tracks. Yeah, I mean, we've been blessed with that being so close to the to an 800 bed medical center and literally 50 yards away and so we can use those assets you know when we want someone to teach lung cancer therapeutics let's say we rely on people that do it every day and that's their area of specialty pharmacy or in hematologic malignancies etc and so it's a beautiful relationships we do have split positions but we also draw on the regular um practitioners on the health science side or the health care side to come over to the health science center and, and teach students not to put you on the spot mark but i am anyway um <laughs> as a father um do you, have you experienced the new pediatric um environment at wvu oh you know you know we have um absolutely amazing uh, we, we have a, a five-month-old uh, 
we minted. So you go by months, of course, when they're that young. Um, and yeah, no, no sleep, but <laughs> imagine my wife, but anyway, God bless you. Um, good golly. The, the inter, you know, we're talking about this interprofessional care. It, it is magical to see it happen as a patient or a family member and happen effectively. Um, you mentioned, oh, there's a new new children's hospital. So, all right, it looks nice. It's nice and shiny because it's brand new. But the people inside taught at every moment. It, it was, it was. I have no better word than magical. Just as, as you know, on the parent side, I, I remember both of us, uh, Gretchen and myself, we were like, do we do this in patient care? Do we explain everything, even anticipating what might happen if something hits the fan or whatever? Yeah. You know, it, the explanations, the education to the patients was was astounding. And that was interprofessional on the way. You know, uh, this interprofessional topic, like if you think about the concept going philosophical kind of maybe here, PharmD, like what does that mean if you're not in an interprofessional environment? True. I, I mean, we all pretty right. much have it. So what, what, like what it, it is, I'm not going to say it's meaningless. I'm not going to put down a doctorate. All right. I'm not uh, insane here. It's water. I promise in that thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but until you're in an interprofessional environment and you, you have the, Hey, Dr. G, Hey, Dr. Mark, Hey, whatever to whoever the, the farm D becomes a thing that just yeah. like MD dental, the, the whole, the whole gamut. Yep. it's it's also very incredible and that's what we all strive for you know a shout out to the pharmacists out there who are listening who are more of the the lone rangers because they're in research or they're in technology or they're doing something that doesn't necessarily get them in front of a patient but they're still working with other professionals in order to execute on what they're doing and what Mark said kind of stood out to me because I can't think of any pharmacist in our 305,000 active pharmacists in the United States that isn't doing something that dominoes into something else that affects the patient, even the researcher or, you know, there's a, there's a company in Pittsburgh called Omnix and Omnix is a digital pathology a company that goes down into the cell with high definition um, images that can be emailed and compressed and all this interesting stuff. And they have a pharmacist that works with them. Like that blows my mind. I'm like, there you go. But they would have to rely on kicking that data and those images and that outcome to someone else to verify and continue to work with. Even though you might be a lone ranger or, or doing a lot by yourself, it's still interconnected. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that, to be said along those lines is, you know, a pharmacist on a team or on a research team or in a diagnostics company brings a different perspective to a problem or in, and, and a unique one. And I think that, uh, you know, I can give you some examples, but I think that that is very important in, in team approaches to both patient care and to research nowadays, because research really is, a, is becoming much more of a team approach than it was, oh, this is the PI and he's got a project or she's got a project and she's running it. So we, we really rely on teams to, to be able to do research and across the spectrum from the basic, the very basics to all the way to the humans. So, so there's two podcasts in talking about collaboration that I want to a shout out first is fellows on call. It's by two physicians who are brilliant and they are uh, in oncology and they collaborate and they've reached out to the pharmacy podcast network for collaboration as well as having farm d's in their conversation with god bless them like that i thought that was so cool and then curbsiders i don't know if you've ever heard of that one mark but that's a famous podcast one of the most famous physician driven podcasts and curbsiders is all about um collaboration as well but i think this is a um a flag in the in the sand of the pharmacy podcast network that we should be doing more collaboration episodes with, um, with physicians, with specialists, with counselors. I think of your field, Mark, and digging down into pain and really starting to um, get the patient's perspective involved by um, some of the people out there who are in the healthcare profession themselves who have in turn been pain patients uh, that could be much better at explaining things because they understand it from like a 
a clinical perspective. Oh, absolutely. And, and until anyone is a, a patient or the patient, it's it's a whole another ball game. I, uh, one of my go-to things is always, um, actually, I believe I did a pain pod podcast on it, if I remember right. Um, it was, um, I think the episode was uh, COVID kidney stone, keto guido. <laughs> there's, there's more keto to guido. it. But um, <laughs> in the beginning of COVID times, I, I got a kidney stone. Got dropped off at the ER by my family. Nobody could go in. And of course, as pain guy, roll in there in excessive pain. And they're like, oh, how do you rate your pain? One to 10. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, go. now I'm in the chair. I'm like, what a preposterous question. <laughs> and in a pandemic, I was dropped off on the ER on a Friday night, Friday the 13th, by the way. Oh, no. And you're asking me if it's like a 20 or not. Uh, hello. You know, of course, I said 8.5, by the way. Um, <laughs> if they're gonna, more they're precise. Silly questions demand silly answers. But, uh, <laughs> But it, it, you know, once you're in that realm, it 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 teaches you more. It it's um, I, you know, like we talked about parenting earlier. It repeatedly, actually, I I remember doing a, an interview with I think it was Pharmacy Times, one of them, um, and it, it was about work life balance. And uh, the, one of their little mic drop quotes. It was a paper, of course, but was uh, I remember saying that um, you know, being a pharmacist made me or prepared me to, to be a better dad being a dad made me a better pharmacist mm. uh, you know that that cyclical scenario there of, of the and whether it's parent patient along the way it's just being able to relate to people you know like bill was saying about the perspectives that we bring, bring as pharmacists to any team typically healthcare but it could be beyond digital therapy whatever it, it's it prevents those aha moments of of people not thinking about something um, I, I remember years back when uh, very good efforts in various states, they wanted to get uh, reportings of naloxone dispensings into the PDMP. Um, and, and all it would have taken was one phone call to one pharmacist to just uh, inform legislators that that's not a controlled substance. It can kind of can't, but won't be reported to a database of controlled substances. It is that simple. But if the pharmacist isn't at the table, not necessarily Dan from Netflix, <laughs> any of us, <laughs> If you're not at the table, you can't contribute that. And then a lot of people look silly. That's true. And I, I think that we overlook, um, we overlook reaching out to other specialists or people in this case, medication management experts, because they, people are just getting so busy and, and they're being crushed by the patient load and they just move on to the next where you're not thinking it through in the best interest of what the, um, patient needs and in, in clarifying what is safety and what is the best practice. And, you know, pharmacists are standing in the wings, especially in our health systems, waiting for those opportunities. I, I've never met a pharmacist, an active pharmacist, even in our community setting, that isn't willing to help people through educating people, through telling them with flagging something that they should be aware of, uh, that could be like a contraindication or an allergy or whatever. But, um, that's a good point, Mark. And and even to willingness and, and desire to to learn in the interprofessional environment too. It, it's, you know, I, I I am blessed to work with some advanced practice providers that they're doing a physical exam and I'm watching it like I'm trying to figure out what kind of voodoo they're doing. <laughs> like you moved it that way and that way, and now you know exactly, you know, oh, that's an L4, L5 issue. Now I, you know, they've taught me, but we don't do that. <laughs> That's right. not our zone as pharmacists, but why can't we learn it? Because sure. we're going to teach the elders about medicine. So let's, let's, you know, we can learn too. So I think maybe an atypical way we think of interprofessional education is with legislators. And we take the opportunity to bring our students to pharmacy day to legislature mm -hmm. over there. And they talk face to face with legislators about issues that we think are important. And I think that is kind of an interprofessional education. Um, and the other example of you that is shout out to one of our faculty, Krista Capehart, who oh, yeah. is has a joint position between the West Virginia Board of Pharmacy and the School of Pharmacy. And so she's located in Charleston, closer to the state capitol. And she is frequently called on by health <laughs> committees to come over and help testify and, and sort out things that they're going through as the content expert for pharmacy. Um, and you would be amazed at how many times they call on her for many different types of uh, medically related legislation. I think Bill, we have one or two pharmacies. Between Bill and Mark, I have three interviews now. <laughs> I have Gretchen. Obviously. I have Gina. Gina. And now Krista. Krista. Yeah. 
There you go. So what's funny is I made a comment to my mother um, when I was young and I was being a smart ass, of course. <laughs> and she says, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I'm like, I don't care what I do as long as I'm around other intelligent women. And I was, of course, saying this in front of my <laughs> second grade teacher who I was flirting with and trying to be charming. And it worked like I got a laugh out of her. But listen, I'm in an industry that is 62 percent driven by intelligent female mm -hmm. people. And it's just like I can look back. See, mom, here I am. I'm, even though they are Mark and, and Bill, we, look, I know I know who my audience is. Instagram. <laughs> Let's talk about, I don't even want to shift into social media. That's another one, but goodness gracious. I think that the whole point of today's episode is a big, a big why and how can we use a media source, AKA podcasting to help our students get to the next level on almost saying on your terms, on your time, by giving you extra stuff to not only help create because you just, we just all agreed that creating and is a form of teaching and teaching helps you actually learn better and coming together as, like I said, two, three, six pharmacy students coming together and talking about a topic. I want to do whatever um, we can do to work with WVU to facilitate and maybe experiment with this a little bit mm -hmm. and see what we can do and vet it out. Because like I said, there's 140 pharmacy schools out there. I'd like to have um, you know, 10 of them, obviously I'd like to pick ones that were close by cause it, it's fun to go and, and actually be in the midst of these future pharmacists and how excited that they are. Um, and, and then have the opportunity to help teach how to accelerate and make it simpler because I, I just talked with Anisha Patel, An Anisha Patel, who is a pharmacist in the UK and she has a podcast that's widely listened to over there. She got an award just two weeks ago for her podcast called My uh, My Pharmacist Diaries and um, or The Pharmacist Diaries. And she and I were talking about how hard it was in the beginning to learn to do something and do it well, especially being professionals, her being a pharmacist, she's very detailed oriented and how that can prevent people from moving forward. Mark, you said, just do it but there's a lot of pharmacists out there. The personality of a pharmacist, because I love you all so much <laughs> and I've, I've stalked you and watched you. So I know this is a personality trait. You don't want to do something that you are afraid that it's not going to be good enough. And it, because, uh, and on one side of it, if you do something wrong, someone could die. It's <laughs> not keeping them safe. <laughs> no pressure. Um, but then on the other side in like, content development, it's okay to make mistakes. That's how we get better. So um, I'm coming after you, WVU School of Pharmacy. Well, you know, I think it's it's the researcher in all of us too, right? Sure. Research fails more times than it, it, it uh, is successful by far. And we try to instill that in students. We don't make progress by in, until we can make mistakes and then learn from those mistakes. And I I think that philosophy is is good to have and and one we can take as we think about experimenting around with uh, podcasting and and accentuating learning by doing that. So. I also want this to spill out into our public because we are in the realm of fake information and bad information. Mm -hmm. And if you go on Twitter or TikTok or um, not so much LinkedIn, that's why I love LinkedIn because it's a little bit more, you know, definitely more professional. But there's so many social media um, sources out there. Um, I have seen uh, pharmacists sprout up as social media um, stars where they're creating hundreds of thousands of listeners of, of followers based on them finally coming and saying, taking control. No one, no one, you know, waited around um, for um, for them to say they could set up a TikTok. They didn't. There's several of them that are so creative, but um, um, they they were angry at the bad information. So they came mm -hmm. to the social media platform to communicate with the public. Well, we have a relationship with Podbean, which is a podcast hosting service. And that organization's uh, education team has come to the Pharmacy Podcast Network about three or four times so far and searching for pharmacists to reference for things like chronic kidney disease or 
uh, you know, uh, blood pressure or many of the things that they wanted the insights of a pharmacist. And so what I'm setting up, because I always have four or five dominoes to topple <laughs> ahead of everything else, um, is the fact that I know that in the future, it's going to be the public that is going to be is going to be searching for the truth, and they're going to be searching for people that know what they're talking about and that they can trust. And I think of this, lat, you know, the, the pandemic. Nobody was ready for it, and it hit us all, you know, pretty quickly. However, if there was a future, you know, if there was ever something like that to ever happen again, we would have a lot of referenceable material that we didn't have uh, two or three years ago in the form of video, YouTube, TikTok, and of course podcasting that could really have our public feeling less stressed because they're not sure who to believe because of things like conspiracy theories and fads and different things that are happening. But um, it, from a pub, now transferring from the pharmacy student, we talked about the, the, the practicing pharmacist. Now I want to turn it over before we close out today. Mark, I'm going to kick it off to you. The, the concept of podcasting for the public and public safety. Yeah, uh, first golden rule of ever having a microphone is know your audience, right? Uh, one of the, here's a, a little tricky thing I'm running into in a first world problem way uh, for a uh, pain pod. Uh, you got patients starting to listen. So now our fancy medical mm. jargon is not really gonna mm. work out. That's a different audience. Yeah, and I don't wanna look silly. So, but you know, how do you, how do you appease everyone there and, and hopefully educate along the way too? Uh, but that, that is, a it's not an untapped realm, but it, it's certainly an opportunity as well, especially to Todd's points when you have a trusted entity that's already proven to know their stuff as an organization, why wouldn't patients, the lay public, of course, go to that source? I mean, yep. it, it's, there's already the trust there. Um, it, that's, it's a no brainer uh, yep. along the way. What do you think? You think public, uh, reach? I, I do, and um, I'll give you maybe one example. I mean, it's um, early in the pandemic. Of course, there were some potential remedies that were being touted by not necessarily medical professionals. And there were some that there was data out there, but it was being misinterpreted. And so um, I felt like I had to do something. So my daughter, who was marketing major at the time, I had her take the iPhone and we went into our pharmacy museum and I started in the mm. patent medicine section cool. and I said, look, this is snake oil, literally. <laughs> it is. And they sold it then. And I said, this was back in the day before the FDA regulated things, before we did formal studies and things. Now, you know, we went to a separate section in the museum and said, look, we, we teach all our students and medical students, et cetera, to how to interpret medical literature. And I showed them the graph that was being misinterpreted and why that was wrong. I said, trust your medical professionals to make medical decisions. And I think that that kind of message maybe is the start of it. And then people will then say, oh yes, the pharmacist is trained to figure out, you know, what of these might be appropriate for me. Um, we try to teach our students that too. It's best not to get on the back end of a prescription and say, oh, that's not right for this patient. It's best to get on the front end when you're working with the physician or the nurse practitioner or whoever and saying, this is what I think is the right uh, drug or, or therapy for that patient. And it, it, it's a lot easier process. It's better for the patient, it's better for the system, and it's less expensive. Yeah, good points. I have enjoyed this immensely. I certainly hope that um, we'll do this again. I, I think the next time that we'll be in, engaged, we'll be at the P3 oh, yeah. get together. Is when it the when P3s again? Yep. You are, when you're back in the PharmD curriculum, um, this is a call out to other schools of pharmacy. I, I mean, there is the philosopher, Mr. Farrell, that says, if you're not first, you're last, so if you're, <laughs> you're already last. We've done it. <laughs> um, but this guy, get him in your classroom. Oh my goodness. Uh, we probably should have taped it, but we don't want to tape it, right? <laughs> um, electric with student pharmacists. Uh, just uh, as a faculty member being able to sit back and say, nailed it, as far as a guest lecturer. Um, it, it, seriously, consider having someone come in. I mean, we've even chatted about different things of, uh, if anybody in the room likes to get uncomfortable, it's, it's, this guy and then another one, probably all of us actually, but 
even thinking like, oh, should we ever do a, an elective rotation of podcasting and all that? Right. Uh, again, why not? Mm -hmm. Now, we have national entities that we report to, but, you know, the same folks that would say in the end, tally ho, good job. How'd you come up with that? Why not? Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's um, true. Within the right parameters. So. Absolutely. It can be all be controlled. The fun thing about podcasting, especially for our clients, is everything is recorded and edited. So we have an opportunity to, you know, reference, you know, any mistakes or change things. When I think of content for student to student, I think it needs to be as raw as possible. And, mm -hmm. and then just announce, hey, this is not the Bible. This is, <laughs> you know, this is just, just hearsay. <laughs> this is just opinion. But when you start moving closer to the uh, journals, reference, referenceable journals, and you start moving even closer to the patient, that's where you really start tightening up on. I mean, I've worked with. Um, uh pharma where they've come to us for podcast creation and that's a chore of how many times you're flipping and flopping and taking things out and switching things around in comparison to more of an editorial opportunity to talk and and have a balance between the two because there is a balance between the two and that's kind of how that's how scientific i've become in podcasting for the profession of pharmacy mm -hmm. i'm very sensitive to referenceable data because i always say that podcasting is a great source of secondary information in support of information but in in my humble opinion it shouldn't be a primary source of information aka joe rogan out there saying all kinds of crazy <laughs> stuff you know he's not the pod father <laughs> he's not the pod father chat the pod father of pharmacy <laughs> or chat gpt exactly Hey, you know what they say? Um, that AI will take over podcasting someday. So I'll probably be out of a job anyway. <laughs> Hopefully I'll have made enough money by then and I can move to Florida. <laughs> All right. Well, that was this week in pharmacy. Um, I was with uh, Bill Petros, Dr. Petros, uh, Mark Garofoli, Dr. Garofoli. It was so good to have you both here from the WVU uh, School of Pharmacy. Um, have to have you back. I can't wait to come down and see you in October. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. See you later. Thanks for listening to this week in Pharmacy.